You're listening to Music Tectonics. The Colossal Future. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Music Tectonics, the podcast that goes beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm Trista Neuer Jaeger, Chief Strategy Officer at Rock, Paper, Scissors, the PR firm that's all about music innovation. If you know me at all, you know I'm always intrigued by new music tech ideas that buck the trend and poke a big hole in our assumptions and cliches. One of those ideas is that the future might just be analog. If you look at Gen Z and younger and their love of things like cassette players, or if you look at vinyl's ongoing mystique, you might say, sure, analog's not dead, but is it really the future? Then you got to think about quantum computers to jump from nostalgia to a bit of future shock here. And you really start to wonder what analog technologies could do for and to music. So there are lots of other analog possibilities um, out there and there that are emerging, especially in the realm of music making. And that's why I got a little bit obsessed when I heard what our guests today talk about um, and what they do. So I'm bringing them on for our episode today, which is part of our Colossal Future series. They're both from a new startup called Eternal Research, and they are exploring the world of analog music creation in stunning new ways. Um, so meet Alexandra Fiera and Bryn Nibor. Did I get that right, Bryn? Pretty close, yeah. Uh, Nibor. <laughs> Nibor. Okay, great. Thanks for joining me today, Alexandra and Bryn. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So... Alexandra, I'd love to start hearing um, a little bit more from you. Can you tell us how you got started creating instruments? I remember you saying once in a previous conversation that you were, were a musician without an instrument. How did you make an instrument that was right for you? Um, well, it, a lot of it began from not beginning because I wanted desperately as a child to like learn piano, to learn a string instrument, to do any of that stuff. And it just was not really in the cards for me and my family and every everyone in it. It was uh, it was kind of one of those things that was just dangled beyond me, and I could never actually, you know, get lessons or or the support I needed to actually learn it. So it was kind of something that was always out there. And my experience with music was always like from the listener side, and it was always something that came to the radio, and I I felt like I experienced it in such a deep sensational way that it was something that from a very young age like haunted me and made me interested in it and mm -hmm. how it was even made it was like a magic very magical thing um and i think when it came to making the music you know it sort of begins where you just see people performing it and you're like oh i want to perform music and you know i think there was a time when i felt like oh i wanted to perform music but when I actually started learning all the instruments that I could, I realized that I was never completely at home with them. I was always like wanting to learn a different instrument and learn a million different types of instruments and not necessarily um, found, I didn't necessarily find any one instrument to be my instrument. And that was sort of maybe the ideological genesis of this, where I realized that, you know, there's not an instrument that is, you know, kind of a resonant part of who I am. And, and it began as a question for over a decade before I even thought that I could even make an instrument. So how did you get to that moment where you were ready to dive in and try to craft an instrument that where you'd feel at home? Um, I think it was, um, it was kind of in an experiment that Bryn and I were doing, um, I had just turned 30 and we were just, you know, messing around on guitars and making sounds and I was recording it on tape. And I remember, um, I was always interested in like slowing down tape mm -hmm. because it was like, I had a little tape recorder when I was a kid and that was the only thing you could really do with it. You could either speed it up or slow it down. And so from that, I was like, oh, well, I'll take this short bit of 17 seconds of recording and slow it down and you know the 17 seconds if you slow it down by twice it becomes 34 and if you slow it 
you have there down again by a certain percentage and you have a minute in something. And I just kept doing that until I got to about 40 minutes. And wow. what was left over was just these like big harmonic shifts and very, very slow time. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy, but there's like a musicality to this that was mm-hmm. like really interesting to me. And I, I, I didn't believe that I actually could make that. I was like, you know, I was, it was like a very phenomenal thing for me. And, you know, I didn't, I actually at that time was very naive. I had no, I, I really didn't know that like there was this whole experimental world of music and mm-hmm. the way that I come to understand it. I was just kind of like, you know, experimenting with this because I felt like I didn't know what else to do. And, and then Bryn kind of, you know, helped me see that, oh, there's actually people have been doing this and you should like learn about them. And then it, that, that kind of made me realize that, um, this like one-off experience I had was actually part of a bigger narrative of people just making experimental music to like find a resonance within their unique souls. I love it. Bryn, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you and Alexandra have collaborated in this creation process? Uh, sure. Um, in terms of, uh, well, you know, I grew up playing music. I grew up sort of, uh, playing piano and, and guitar, I guess, unlike Alexandra, I, I feel like I've always just been like playing whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 I started playing guitar when I was 11. I was playing piano before that. Um, and I guess I was always a music person. Um, I went to, I went to art school for film actually, but, um, even then was, spending a lot of my off time writing music like you know I was in bands in college I mm-hmm. I was uh playing a lot of guitar but uh also was introduced to performance art in art school um and uh experimental music um started falling in love with you know Philip Glass and Steve Reich and and, and um Julius Eastman um and then meeting people who introduced me to William Bazinski and and um, became friends with uh, with other drone and ambient musicians, um, and so so it started. I because I went to an art school. I think I, I don't haven't really haven't super thought about this very critically, <laughs> but I think like mm-hmm. a big part of the way I started thinking about music was as just another type of performance or, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. or sense sensory um, activation, right? Like painting and music aren't very different. Um, And when when I met Alex, uh, she was doing like more like guitar based work, but very clearly like was trying to sculpt it into something else. And so we talked a lot about that and, and she had access to, um, S- certain like I, I think when I met you Alex I, you had like drum machines I remember you had an, an Elisa's drum machine um mm-hmm. you had a lot of pedals and you were experimenting with like you're like how do I make yeah. this longer I remember <laughs> I remember you're like well, what's a delay that goes even longer than this um <laughs> I love it and and so you know I had like some experience with you know modifying musical equipment just as a hobby mm-hmm. um and then when Alex was, you know, starting to do this stuff she was just mentioning, like, I was like, oh, do you know about Fibertronics? Do you know about William Bazinski, this integration loops? Do you know about the stars of the lid? You know, all these sort of more, not so melodic, but like sound artists, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of just like gave way to us having a lot of fun experimenting with what kind of sounds we could make, not just in a like, Oh, let's just do what these people are doing. But like, how far can we take it on like a, on a conceptual level? Um, and she was like, well, how do you do this? And I was like, I think you could just do this. I don't know. I, and it was, she was just very encouraging of me to, you know, I was very interested in in modifying and, and making circuitry and, and electronics as a hobby. And she was very encouraging of me to like do it with her and be like, we should do this. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. And I was like, um, had already sort of been veering off of the path of 
just being an artist and I was sort of like more interested in um in engineering and creating and inventing as well and she was like very much in that lane so um that's kind of how we just came to start thinking about like well if we're making these sounds like how do we make them more accessible you know what I mean mm -hmm. like we would often have to rig up very delicate very uh you know <laughs> um half acid uh <laughs> types of things to get interesting sounds um that would have to be taken apart or and so we were sort of i think fascinated with how do we make this something repeatable and performative um yeah i love it we're gonna take a really quick break here and then we're gonna come right back and dig more into what the what this duo came up with be right back the news cycle of the music industry and innovation in particular is accelerating at such a fast pace, it can be hard to keep up. That's why I launched Rock Paper Scanner, a free newsletter you can get in your inbox every Friday morning. Check out bit.ly slash RP scanner. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash RP scanner. I scan hundreds of outlets for you from the music trades to the tech blogs, from the music gear mags to lifestyle outlets so that you don't have to. I handpick everything music tech, including industry revenue numbers, AI, cool new user tools, the live music and recording landscapes, partnerships and acquisitions, and everything else a Music Tectonics podcast listener would want to know. Open a browser right now and punch in bit.ly slash RP scanner to sign up right now. Go ahead, hit pause and go to bit.ly slash RP scanner or find the episode's blog post on musictectonics.com and find that link. Happy scanning, but for now, happy listening. Okay, we're back with Alexandra and Bryn of Eternal Research. And I want to ask kind of a big question, which you can answer with, so you know, your specific experience. But why look at analog methods in in particular for sound generation. I mean, it sounds like everyone um, was was making stuff with, you know, pl plenty of knowledge, sort of digital tools, et cetera. Um, you know, but why, why did you turn to these analog methods? Um, well, I think because I, I just firmly believe that, you know, the beginning and all, end of all experience is an analog experience. And if you don't understand that and appreciate that, and what is digital? It, it, to me, it seems like um, just a language that's really important to understand because you know you could code the most complicated thing in the world, but if you don't understand the analog experience, you know you won't understand how it'll be felt or the emotions that will go into it. And so, I don't really see analog and digital being at opposition in any way. They're mm -hmm. they're literally like two different legs of the same uh, same beast. And I think that whenever we kind of say something should be just one or the other, then we kind of get into a trap. I mean, there's always a greater power in a manifold operation of things than just being so hard-lined about the way a thing should be. And um, I, I just have a lot of experience in film photography and I was also like very slow to adopt digital things um I was really against it in a way that now seems pretty crazy but I was like you know I grew up in Pennsylvania kind of in the country and I was like you know the technology's bad I literally like I was like really anti-technology I wrote on a typewriter I was like really into the most basic things and and it was because I I just cherish the feelings it gave me. It like really in the end, it wasn't about the technology. It was that the experience of feeling those things was so important to me that I didn't want it to be changed or corrupted. And, and that's what it was really about. And so I had to like solve this conundrum in me before I could really make an instrument because you know, you do have to deal with digital things if you want to like get things done with the precision you need and the ways you want to do it. So, you know, I really had to kind of let down my guard and, you know, accept the digital side of the world in order to really show the potentials of the analog. It was, it was kind of part and parcel. 
I'd love I'd love to dig in a little bit more into what analog gives us. So it sounds like there's you have a a, a strong set of of feelings or intuitions about you know analogs, um, you know, kind of contribution to our sonic worlds or our creative process. And so I'm curious if we can talk, if you were talking to someone who was a technologist or a music maker, you know, what would you point them towards? Like what, what, what should we be looking to, uh, looking for when we are thinking about analog processes? Well, um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the mm -hmm. underlying theory that has kind of guided me in this is this theory I've been developing about um, the pace of technological advance is always greater than the utilization of any one technology. And what that means is that, you know, there's always going to be a new technology before the full potential of any one technology is realized. And so because of that, um, an old technology, old in quotes, um, can still provide insights and expressions that the new one um, might not be able to achieve simple be, simply because it's a new thing. So it's, you know, sometimes a thing having existed for a while allows us to, you know, really explore the deeper potentials of it, you know. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of an aspect that has guided me in that. And that, that makes sense. Where do you see this field of potential? Like as you're, as you're sort of pushing things forward and, and Bryn, feel free to chime in if you'd like, where, you know, where do we have still to explore? What's the sort of uncharted territory that you two are mapping with eternal research? Well, I think it's kind of difficult sometimes to talk. Uh, like I, I'm never quite clear I, I, on the electrical <laughs> side, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, Analog and digital means kind of different things than it means colloquially. Like I think, uh -huh. it, I think generally, people who aren't engineers think of analog as like a string being plucked, mm -hmm. and digital as a circuit board making noise. And and I think that that's you know if that's that's something true. Um, but I mean, there's also analog electricity, uh, analog signals and, and, and then digital signals, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think those are sort of different aspects of those things in terms of, in terms of the physicality that like the colloquially analog things bring, like, I, I don't think, I don't think that, I feel like what happened was there was a digital or you know electronic introduction in you know the 60s 70s but really the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. when people when like cons you know general consumers were able to get their hands on these types of things um like we're in a very new era for electronic music um and electronic instruments um and i think Al what alex is trying what I always take from when Alex talks about this is that like people kind of skip to conclusions mm -hmm. about, okay, well we have drum machines now. So the people who made the very first thing that came to their head, uh, that's what drum machines are. And now we can move on and there's nothing to like think about. Um, and then it takes people and smaller companies to go back to drum machines and be like, well, what else can we do? Like what else do we need or what else it, what what does this technology imply? Because our current system isn't that interested in like plumbing the depths of ideas, more mm -hmm. so just, you know, how many can we, you know, sell? Um, <laughs> so I think, I think in terms of analog, like as a concept colloquially, like the way that electronic instrumentation and, uh, instrumentation um, affected the performance of music, I don't think has really been that explored at all. Um, I think that like, you know, craft work, we're like, we're just going to stand here and play our synths, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> and, and then that's sort of been it for a long time. Like DJs are just standing up there pumping their fist to 
you know, Ableton, pro, you know, programming. And like, that's all fine. And, and I love mm -hmm. all of those, you know, lots of musicians who play electronic music that way. Um, but the idea of performers playing instruments that are influenced by current or even modern technology, I don't know if like anyone really has been interested or, or very few major um, movements have actually been interested in doing that. It's still in the realm of... I feel like that kind of thing is still in the realm of noise musicians and mm -hmm. performance artists. And I think the Demon Box is is a attempt to bring that type of sensibility to someone who isn't already inundated in the research that we've we've been doing for the past 10 years. So let's just uh, explain the demon box for a second oh, here. Sorry. Can you introduce us? No, no, it's great. We get. I love how the demon box likes to sneak in. <laughs> That's what it does. It's a sly. It's a sly <laughs> instrument. So tell us a bit about the demon box. It's your first instrument that you're releasing uh, commercially. Um, like introduce us to this this interesting new friend. Well, I think I'll take this. Go for it. Um, yeah, go for it. The, uh, the Demon Box is kind of the culmination of all of our experiments over you know, many years. And by experiments, I mean, you know, we would basically take all the equipment we have and see how we could set it up in a room to make some sonic effect. You know, we how can we put all of our delay pedals together? What can we use as inputs? And we would just set up entire rooms with this and, and you know, just experiment and see what the output would be. And, and you know, we kind of just felt like the results were so great. But the thing is, the setup was so laborious. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these experiments, I feel like I would set them up and I'd leave them there for months because there were just so so many wires going so many places, so many different signal chains. And, and I was like, this is this is amazing. The outputs we're getting. And I, you know, made almost, I made albums from some of this stuff. And, but at the same time, it's like, this is uh, kind of like so inaccessible and just the amount of equipment it takes. And it was, it just felt like a thing that was so magical, but we were like, you know, we want to do music and we want to be around music. And we maybe, what if we tried to make a company that like took this experience and put it, into a, a device that would allow people to experience that same magicalness and potentials um, in a smaller setting um, that even had more potential because now it's smaller. Um, so it's it's a, a machine that is you know uh, very much senses the electromagnetic world, but then it also deals with uh, metallic resonances and um, it, it's a machine that doesn't really have an axis it's not about left and right it's about just like perceiving and for me too it's also just been this meditation on design <clears throat> you know really really seeing all the biases that affect music output and and all of the the bias and prejudices that limit music and then we basically tried to design into this a way to subvert those biases, the bias of stereo left and right, the bias of numbers, um, two and two and four and, you know, all these <clears throat> even numbers instead of threes and nines and elevens. <clears throat> so um, it was kind of just this big design project that is by and large a musical instrument, but it's also a theoretical instrument and a philosophical instrument that is meant to kind of cause people to approach music from a different number system and a different idea of what music even is. So I love that. I'm really curious, and I think this might be interesting for our listeners to talk about the process of like finding these biases, right? Because because the <laughs> biases are, are we're often blind to them, right? We just sort of see, just like the drum machine you were mentioning, or Kraftwerk's sort of like performance attitude. Um, we're so used to it that we think that is what is, right? And we cannot perhaps imagine our way around it. I'm wondering how you went about, especially Bryn, you you who you know grew up playing music and and being surrounded by instruments. How do you go about breaking down these the the sort of more rigid vision of what an instrument has to be and 
looking for new ways to to play around with it. Well, that's that's all Alex. I mean, like I, when we, <laughs> you know, when we first when we first started working together, I feel like uh, I was like Alex would just say stuff to me that was so baffling. I'm like, she she's just like really questioning of anything that feels comfortable or assumed in a way mm. like I feel like it's hard because you know I grew up you know with a little bit of like X-Files question everything you know <laughs> kind of like <laughs> dirt on my you know uh, chip on my shoulder but not in a not in a not in a necessarily uh, antagonistic or rebellious way just in a purely curious way and I, and I think that's what's so interesting about Alex's mind is like <laughs> she was just like yeah, everyone always assumes things should be even. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I get, yeah, but I it's guess. it's a good point. It's but a good it, point. I've always thought about that too. Like, even with like uh, DAWs or um, drum machines, it's like the, you know, it's all four, like the four beat is so right. wedged in there. And it's like, you it's, can break it, but it's hard. And it's stuff that just like, I think a lot of intelligent people just are like, well, it must just be the way our brains are naturally aligned and it's like mm. no that's very superstitious supernatural religious thinking almost and it's like yeah. nothing has to be any one way and i think alex i don't want to say naturally but you know her, her mind kind of came to these conclusions of just like honestly investigating everything and just being like well would it be cooler if we had three or would it be more interesting or feel more like sensually satisfying you know like it just like uh, trying out anything and everything, even if it feels weird at first, um, artistically, just is kind of her whole vibe. So it, it took me a, a I will I will be honest, years to just be like, okay, let's try it, you know. And <laughs> and I feel like you know sometimes it really pays off. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely um, <laughs> I appreciate Bryn's patience, and <laughs> because I kind of can't help myself, and it's. Part of it is that I think because I didn't learn music in the traditional ways, I would just say things in a very matter of fact way that would just seem like, you know, very naive. But I mean, I really intently meant it. I'm like, you know, why, why does everyone want everything to be divided by two? Mm. Like, why? like, what's the real point of that? And they're like, well, I mean, why 88 keys on a keyboard, on a keyboard? Why? Why stereo left and right? What, who devised this number system? And I had to do a lot of learning to get there where um, I actually, uh, you know, I listened to a lot of music. And I loved film music when I was growing up. And I think film music allowed me to like see the relationship to visuals. And mm -hmm. I was surprised when people were like, film music's like not as hot important or interesting is just the biggest, most popular music around. I was like, what are you talking about? This music is the most amazing experience. And so I was kind of in this weird place where I had these intense emotions around things, but like no one else seemed to feel that way. And, you know, I, it kind of led me along a path where I, I really got into like listening to like just the most eclectic mix of things where I would listen to, you know, John Williams scores, but then I would listen to, um, like Delta Blues, and then I would listen to, uh, uh, you know, Moroccan guitarists, and then I would listen to gamelan music, and I'd be like, I would never come to it being like, one of these is better than the other, one of them is more developed. It was really just listening to it the way you listen to the ocean, or listening to the sound of a cave. You know, it's like, like it was when I really balanced myself and I was like, all of these sounds are phenomena and they are important and I want to listen to them. And then I was able to see that, you know, all these different number systems happening, you know, there's not, I'm not just going to impose a value system. I'm just going to listen really deeply and, um, and then just learn from that listening. And then I, when I first moved to New York city, I volunteered at the, the world music Institute and I was exposed to a lot of live music and they had this whole like wall of like record or like CDs from around the world. And I would like, I would like buy them. And, yeah. It was a candy store. And, and then that was one side, but I, I never wanted my musical experience to like be like fetishistic in a sense from a Western perspective. And, and I think I only balanced it out when I like started taking anthropology classes and, you know, learning that 
you know, the progression of anthropology now is really about like the politics of even viewing another culture and what that does and how, you know, that was really important for me to understand that, you know, where I come from, what I'm looking at, what that means. And then that was just one whole aspect of the learning. Um, and then, you know, I also have this really deep love of quantum physics and, you know, the physical world. And, and when I combine them, <clears throat> I realized that, you know, we are, it's like, we are the music makers. We are the dreamers of dreams. <laughs> we're also the makers of all of the, the number systems and we're the ones that choose them. And if we can choose one, why can't we choose the other? And if it sounds bad, you know, in, in the world, in jazz, you know, it's like, if it sounds bad, just keep playing it until it sounds great. If it's the wrong <laughs> note, just keep going until you find the music. It's, yeah, I love it. It was, that was, it was very, like, in, naive and innocent. And it was very, you know, I, I think in that sense that my naivete was like a weird saving grace because it allowed me to operate in this way that I wasn't, you know, afraid of doing certain things because I felt like I would be like fall out of favor with anyone or anything. Cause I had like no, no street cred or no anything. I was mm -hmm. just like, like a, you know, a person who just loved to think about things. So yeah. I, I mean, love that. Oh, oh, I was just going to say, Brent, I'm so sorry. I was going to say, Alexandra, I love that you brought up ethnography. I feel like that's a kind of a missing piece in a lot of thinking about music technology. Um, because if you go down those paths where you're looking at how other people um, from other cultures, listen to music, you start to be able to see your own biases better, right? Like it's a really great aid in reimagining your own musical world. What were you going to say, Bryn? Oh, no, I was just, that's, I was going to continue along that path. Is like, I, I think like it. Alex, you, you said you, you referred to it as like a naivete. And I think that that, you know, the, there is a benefit in naivete when you have an honest and open interest in finding out the answers or educating yourself. And I think that's the thing is that like you, you mentioned like, why does a piano have 88 keys? Uh, and that's like, might seem like a silly question. And like a lot of musicians might just be like, well, because there's, there's like a mathematical reason or whatever, but like mm -hmm. the, the actual answer is so much more interesting and confusing. <laughs> like, is, yeah. Like, if you read about like the evolution from like the harpsichord and Christophori and like you know, like that's the that's how we get here. You know, it's like okay, well, they didn't actually have a reason, or it's like a manufacturing reason, or it's a you know, it's based on math that doesn't necessarily help us right now, or you know, you can change all of these things for lots of different reasons. And I think that that is like, that's the type of quote unquote naivete that is actually really useful and, and, and interesting. I think. I love it. It's the beginner's mind of music tech. Yeah. Uh, hold on one second, everybody. We'll be right back. We're going to talk more about how to translate interesting ideas into new instruments. We'll be right back. The Music Tectonics team has been hard at work programming an amazing lineup of speakers for our 2024 edition. I've had the opportunity to talk with some of our thought leaders, and here's what they're excited about. Joe Toe of Sony Ventures is looking at the big picture. To quote him, Right now, we are witnessing a remarkable convergence of entertainment media encompassing music, gaming, streaming, and more. This fusion within the entertainment landscape is revolutionizing the way fans consume content. It enables deeper connections and engagement with creators through innovative and immersive experiences. By leveraging these diverse media forms, we are fostering a dynamic and interactive ecosystem where creativity and interaction thrive in unprecedented ways. Other hot topics speakers are excited to dive into include AI comes to market, super fans and fandom, late stage streaming, gamers as music fans, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Head over to musictectonics.com slash speakers to check out our amazing lineup of thought leaders updated regularly. Now back to the show. Okay, we're back with Alexandra and Bryn of Eternal Research. And I kind of want to close uh, the, the episode a little bit with some fun speculative, like, you know, goofing around but that's also kind of practical in that um i'm, I'm curious how uh you two would recommend 
people approach, say, turning an idea or a, a you know a concept or a big question like you've asked Alexandra into a new kind of form factor for instruments. And one thing that's already always kind of bugged me about both digital and you know physical instruments nowadays is they all kind of are descended from. Um, you know, acoustic instruments in a lot of ways. Like they do have the 88 keys or they uh, look like a console that someone built back in the 1950s in a studio, uh, but it's just on a screen, right? So I'm curious, how how would you recommend people go about translating a philosophical concept or a discovery or even just a question into an instrument that can innovate and change the way we relate to making and listening to music? Um. I mean, if I could begin with that, I because I I think it's a really um, surprising part of the process that I'm is that you know uh, when I was growing up, I had two family members who were who were blind, and I remember the experience of them like talking to me. They would hold my hand and they talk to me, and you know I remember their voices. I mean, even though they passed away decades ago, and it was like you know I looking back, like, I don't know if I like know other people's voices as well as theirs, but they were like holding my hand as they were talking. And I think that connection with the the voice there too, like made the experience that much more of a thing. And so, you know, it is really important to like acknowledge the personal side of things that it will be people using this. And then, you know, um, when we devise this, like, I wanted to make an instrument that would be inclusive of people of all like uh, of all experiences, people who are visually impaired, even people who are quote unquote, you know, deaf who have the inability to hear frequencies we take for granted. This instrument, you know, with certain engineering and help can actually help people who can't hear hear. And so, you know, it was it was a thing where it's like, you know, it's like, what do you want your contribution to be? And it's like, do I just want to make an instrument that sits with other instruments and becomes a commodity? Or do I want to make an instrument that will allow me to hear um, like other voices in a really deep, deep way, like hear, hear into the cave of other people's souls. And that's sort of um, really important to question to ask when you're, you're making something like, like, why are you even doing this? And, and you can make a a commercial thing. That's totally fine. We're making a commercial thing, but you know, just for my own ethos, I had to make something that was like peering into that cave and listening to it. Amazing. Bryn, how did you make the decisions? I know, I know there's a lot of interesting decisions along the way, but do you have any insights into how you make the decisions of turning um, these kind of amazing, beautiful ideas into an instrument that people can play? Um, no, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think... <laughs> nah, I, never mind. No, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's really hard. I mean, it's... I think one of the things you kind of have to let go of is being worried about making too many mistakes. Mm. Um, like... <laughs> There's reasons that people, I feel like maybe, (laughs) I feel like maybe if I was listening to this 10 years ago, I might be like, okay, well, how do you solve all of these incredibly difficult like manufacturing problems and, and engineering problems? And it's like, yeah, that's really tough. And I think, you know, it's not, there is a reason why everything comes in a square form factor with a keyboard. It's because that's what's made and we, that's what people have on hand and, you know, there's, 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 ex- we live in a, you know, global capitalist world and, you know, making decisions that are, uh, you know, different ideas um, and informed by different ideas can lead to decisions that are more expensive or more time consuming or may not work on first blush. Um and you have to solve even more strange issues that you weren't expecting to run into. Um, so I think it's I think on a on a very like technical level, it's it's just about you know realizing that you are doing something for the first time, and people are going to be weird to you about it, uh, <laughs> and think you're doing something wrong because you are like doing something quote unquote wrong, um, and that and that's 
that can be tough. You know, it, it can be hard to, you know, talk to somebody who, you know, is just in manufacturing and is like, why would you do any of this? And it's like, why are you questioning that? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Just like, take my money and make my thing. Well, but you know, it's like, <laughs> it's interesting though, because people are, are, it feels sort of low stakes compared to a lot of other things going on in the world, but like mm-hmm. people do get uncomfortable when their assumptions are questioned. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's sort of the main thing to, to try to get over in your own head when you're making something like this is just like, don't get uncomfortable, just see where it leads you. I love it. Or maybe get uncomfortable and just stay uncomfortable yeah. and still see. And maybe where it that's leads you. okay too. And it'll be cool <laughs> later. And just always ask why why am I even uncomfortable? And 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 also never like if you can answer something within 10 or 20 seconds, then it's not really the right question. Hmm. You need to like create questions for yourself that might take you 10 years or a lifetime to answer. Those are the questions that are really important. Thank you so much, both of you. This has been a wonderful conversation and I'm kind of inspired. I kind of want to go make my own instrument now. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I'm gonna... <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That's so kind of you. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed um, hearing these thoughts about analog, about exploring new instruments, about breaking down our biases as we consider form factors and instruments and music making and all that good stuff. I want to close the episode with a quick uh, listen to some of what the Demon Box, so that's Eternal Research's first instrument, can do. So we'll hear a little bit of the voice of the Demon Box as we say goodbye. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know we do free monthly online events that you, our lovely podcast listeners, can join? Find out more at musictectonics.com. And while you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference and sign up for our newsletter to get updates. Everything we do explores the seismic shifts that shake up music and technology, the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's my favorite platform. Connect with me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it. We'll be back again next week, if not sooner. You're listening to Music Tectonics.